Good morning, Bobcats. All right, so today we're going to start chapter 11, and again, we'll do part of it today, and then we'll finish the other half uh, on Monday. So in yesterday's readings, um, it was all about Christmas time and the gifts that they were giving, and at the end of the chapter, Fudge admits to Peter that he's a great pretender, um, and uh, Peter also kissed Joanne, even though it was on her head and she had kissed him. So maybe there's kind of a crush going on there as well. Um, so chapter 11 starts out, it's called Catastrophes. You know what a catastrophe is? A catastrophe is like is a huge, um, huge disaster almost. So here we go. Dad stopped talking about his book. I had the feeling it wasn't going very well. Instead, he talked about growing vegetables and how to cook them Chinese style or about the Princeton University hockey team. He took me to all their home games. When Jimmy Fargo came to visit, he joined us. I'm really into violence, Jimmy said. I think hockey's a great game. It's a lot bloodier than football and there are more team fights. That's not what hockey is all about, Dad argued. It's a game of skill, of timing, of precision. Yeah, sure, Jimmy said. I know all of that, but it's still great to see the blood bounce on the ice. Blood bounces on ice? I asked. Yeah, Jimmy said, and so does vomit. See, it has to do with the temperature of the ice versus the temperature of the body and... Jimmy, please, Dad said, turning green. It's true, Mr. Hatcher. They both bounce on ice. Maybe so, Dad said, but that's not the reason we go to the games. I know, Jimmy said, but it's a nice side event. Dad shook his head and began to check off players' names on the list inside his program. Jimmy leaned across me and tapped Dad's arm. I'm not a violent person, Mr. Hatcher. Don't get the wrong idea. It's just that it's a healthy way to use up some of my of my aggressive energy. Hey, Jimmy, I said. Yeah? Shut up. Okay, sure, Jimmy said. And he was quiet until nearly the end of the third period when four of the players got into a fight. Then he stood up and yelled, Kill! Kill! I tugged at his sweater until he sat down again. Later, when I was in bed and Jimmy was in his sleeping bag, he said, I've been seeing the school psychologist twice a week. She says I have a lot of anger because my parents split up. Take my word for it, Peter. Divorce is a catastrophe. You should watch your parents all the time and listen to every word they say so they can't ever take you by surprise. For the next couple of weeks, I paid close attention to my parents, looking for possible signs of divorce. But I didn't see or hear anything unusual, and soon I got tired of watching and listening. Besides, whenever my parents fight... They wind up laughing. In February, we celebrated Tootsie's first birthday. She carried on a family tradition of smashing her fist into her birthday cake. Grandma, who believes in handing our gifts to everyone, not just the birthday person, brought me a four-color ballpoint pen and Fudge a new Brian Tumpkin book. Read, Fudge told, Brian, told Grandma. She took him on her lap and read him the latest story about Uriah, one of Brian Tumpkin's characters. I used to really like his books when I was a little kid, I said. I'm not a little kid, Fudge reminded me. Next year I'll be in first grade. You want to see a little kid? Look at the birthday girl. The birthday girl was sitting in her high chair making a mess. Grandma had brought her a new baby-proof cup, one that refused to turn over no matter how hard Tootsie tried. Finally, Tootsie screeched, picked up her cup, and dumped her milk over her head. Tootsie's first birthday party could go down as a real catastrophe, I said. What's a castradophy? Fudge asked. It's when something goes wrong, I said. Or when everything goes wrong, Mom added. Talk about catastrophes. Six weeks later, Tootsie learned to walk. At first, it was just a few feet at a time, from Mom to Dad or from me to Fudge. But pretty soon, she was toddling all over the place. Sometimes, she'd crash land, and if no one was watching, she'd laugh and start all over again. But if she caught one of us looking at her, she'd start bawling and wouldn't stop until she got an arrowroot cookie. And Tootsie wasn't the only one crash landing. Fudge was learning to ride his bicycle. One of his major problems was stopping. Instead of using his brakes, he kept trying to jump off while his bike was still going. I was wrong when I told him he might get a couple of scraped knees. Elbows, knees, and head were more like it. Constantly, but he refused to give up. He was really determined to get to ride to school. Finally, toward the end of April, Mom and Dad decided that Fudge had mastered the art of bike riding well enough to ride to school with Daniel, who had learned on his front lawn, just the way he said he would, without a bruise or a scrape anywhere. And it would have turned out okay if only Fudge had remembered to use his brakes when he got to the bike rack at school, but he didn't, so he crashed into the rack, 
knocking down a pile of bikes and wound up with scraped elbows, scraped knees, and torn jeans. Don't tell mommy, Fudge said, or she'll never let me ride to school again. I think mommy's going to notice anyway, I said. You're a mess. I carried him into the nurse's, nurse, nurse's room. Miss Elliot washed off his cuts and bruises with peroxide, and when she did, Fudge let out a howl. Not that I blamed him. I could practically feel the sting myself. But Fudge didn't stop with one howl. He kept it up, making such a racket that Mr. Green, the principal, heard him and came running down the hall. What's going on here? Mr. Green said. Scrape knees and elbows, Miss Elliot said. Scrape knees and elbows, Mr. Green repeated. When I was a boy, I had scraped knees and elbows all the time. Used to roller skate and fall down week after week. Fudge sniffled and said, too bad you weren't any good at it. Who says I wasn't any good at it? Mr. Green asked. You just said you were always falling down, Fudge said. That's because I took a lot of chances, Mr. Green said. Now, I want you to hurry back to your classroom because we're having a surprise visitor in a little while. Who is it? Fudge asked. It's a very famous man, someone who writes and illustrates children's books. His name is Brian Tumpkin. Brian Tumpkin is alive? Fudge asked. Alive and well and on his way to our school. Brian Tumpkin is alive, Fudge said again. I never knew that. Did you know that, Peta? I never thought about it, I said. Mr. Green faced Miss Elliot and said, Lucky break for all of us that he's agreed to do a program for our girls and boys. I'm afraid I don't know who he is, Miss Elliot said. Then you must be dumber than I thought, Fudge told her. First, you put peroxide on my cuts without blowing to take away the sting, and now you don't know who Brian Tumpkin is? I never blow on cuts, Miss Elliot said. You can spread germs that way. Mommy always blows when she puts on peroxide. Yes, well, Mr. Green said, let's get back to our classrooms now. It's almost 